Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Strobe Talbot. And what a beautiful afternoon it is outside. So this is obviously a very dedicated audience. Welcome to the 12th annual Raymond Aron Lecture, Restoring Europe, European Economic Leadership. This year's event is in the form of what promises to be a very stimulating conversation featuring Henri de Costa and my Brookings colleague, Don Cohn. Given their topic, we've asked Antoine van Achmal, a trustee of the Brookings Institution and co-chair of our International Advisory Council, to open the program with a few short remarks based on his standing as a thought leader on the global economy. We're also fortunate to have with us as moderator, Jim Hoagland, a longstanding friend of many of us in this room and in this institution, a card-carrying Francophile, and a, prize, and a Pulitzer Prize-winning columnist. His part, part of participation is also particularly fitting since Raymond Aron was not just a philosopher and a political scientist, but also a journalist. On a somber note, I hope you'll feel that it's appropriate for me to mention that Aron was a mentor of Stanley, of Stanley Hoffman, revered by many of us who has just passed away. Finally, our thanks to the Embassy of France and Ambassador Aron for their support and assistance with this lecture series and our work on France within our center on the United States and Europe. I'm not sure that Messrs. Aron and Hoffman would approve, but if any of you are in the business of tweeting, uh, you can do so uh, by using the hashtag of EuroLeadership. So with that, over to you, Antoine. Well, thank you, Strobe. It's an enormous pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, today, uh, first of all, because this is, as Strobe said, the 12th annual uh, Raymond Aron uh, lecture. And I see it kind of as a reward, this introduction, for um, suffering through, uh, not suffering through, but, but, but at school they were asking us to read the editorials of Raymond Aron. <laughs> Uh, and which was, at the time, my French was quite bad, so it was difficult, uh, but very interesting. So I learned how he was not only a friend, friend of, of Sartre, uh, but wrote opium for the intellectuals, which uh, didn't, the intellectuals in France at the time didn't take very kindly, I remember. So, um, and, and so it's great to have today someone who is both a leading French, European, and international a businessman and financier, but also a true intellectual to give the 12th annual um, uh, lecture today. Henri de Castre uh, is a graduate of the famous uh, Ecole Nationale d'Administration uh, and went on to, uh, in a long career, uh, to become the chairman of AXA, which he has done, I think, for the last 14 years or more, 15 years. Uh, uh, AXA was one of my very first clients, so it was very nice <laughs> to see that. And uh, AXA, as all of you know, uh, is not only a leading uh, insurer uh, in uh, France and Europe, but also in the United States, uh, where uh, Alliance Bernstein is one of its uh, subsidiaries, uh, but in, in China, all over uh, Asia, and in fact, uh, all over the world, one of the true the big uh, financial companies in the world. In addition to that, uh, he is chairman of the Institut Montaigne. And uh, that's, I think, appropriate for this time because Montaigne was a moderate uh, at the time of fierce religious wars in France and, and Europe. Uh, that frankly, and I just read a new book about uh, uh, Montaigne, that make ISIS look like child's play. Uh, it was horrible at the time. And he was a man who 
very adroitly maneuvered through that and in his essays wrote about that. And finally, he is the chairman of the uh, very well-known uh, Bilderberg uh, Group. I got a preview of his speech, and so I know that you're in for a treat. Uh, he really uh, is addressing some of the issues that you're reading about every day in the newspapers head on, uh, which will, I think, be very interesting to all of you. With that, uh, let me give it over to uh, Jim Hoagland, who in turn will introduce Don Kong. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, it's a real pleasure and honor for me to welcome you this evening to uh, the Raymond Aron lecture. Um, Raymond Aron, as my friend Strobe has said, uh, was an outstanding intellectual, uh, a political scientist, and a columnist. And indeed, when I first started to think in the early 1980s about writing a column myself, I went to him to seek his guidance and counsel, and he was very generous in providing that. Raymond Aron, as Philip Gordon noted in inaugurating these lectures in 2004, was a bridge between scholarship and policy, and between France and the United States. So it is a pleasure to be able to be on this stage and to welcome our two distinguished speakers to honor Raymond Aron. Uh, we will first hear from Mr. de Castre, who has just been introduced. I will later introduce Donald Cohen more fully. Uh, we will then move into a brief discussion period here on the uh, stage, on the podium, and then throw it open to questions from the audience. Uh, and we will be uh, ending by 7 p.m. So you can get out into a little bit of that gorgeous weather out there. Uh, the Guardian, a leading leftist and uh, very um, literate British newspaper, recently labeled Monsieur de Castro as perhaps the most powerful man in the world. Uh, I think they were uh, alluding a little bit to his role perhaps not only at AXA but at uh, Bilderberg as well because if you follow the conspiracy blogs you will see <laughs> that the Bilderberg runs the world actually. It's the secret society that runs the world. If you, if you have, as I have, been to some of the meetings of the Bilderberg group, you will discover instead that it's a very lively discussion group. Uh, so, without further ado, we will turn to you, Henri. Thank you very much, Jim. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here this evening with you, and I would like to thank very much the Brookings and its president, Strop Talbot, for their invitation. I would like also to thank the Center for United States and Europe, and especially Fiona Hill, Andy Moffat and Philippe Lecor, the French ambassador, Gérard Arrault, and of course, Jim Ogland and Don Cohn. It's a particular emotion for me to be here this evening for this Raymond Aron lecture, because I have a sort of special connection with Raymond Aron, which was uh, someone I deeply admired, and I was, as a young student, encouraged to read his books by my grandfather, because both of them left France in June 40 to join the Gaulle from a small little harbor in the south of France called Saint-Jean-de-Luz. My grandfather found Raymond Aron on the pier and took him with him, telling him we, go, we need to go to England because they will need us in a few weeks to fight on their beaches. Fortunately, it didn't happen. And my grandfather was later the representative of the Free French here in the US and happened to be in Roosevelt's office with Harry Hopkins on the night of the Sicily invasion or I would say uh, landing. So it's with a particular emotion that uh, uh, I start this speech this evening about the European economic leadership. Can it be regained or not? And the reality is, I think, that the only time in history where Europe really had an economic leadership was a brief period of the last 20 or 21 centuries. It was between the end of the 18th century and the beginning, uh, and, yeah, and the beginning of the 20th century because of a combination of demographic, technological, 
and military competitive advantages. The, most of these advantages were gone at the beginning of the 70s. It's clear for me that the military strengths hardly survived the First World War. The technological revolutions have not been European since World War II, and the first stages of the demographic decline were there at the beginning of this century. They started, in fact, at the end of the 20th century. Today, I would say the complexity of our governance structure in the EU, the difficulties of uh, probably too quick enlargement have led to an institutional overload and the very incomplete and insufficient implementation of the Lisbon Agenda have all undermined the European momentum, which had been strong until then, but has been fading since. If we now want to regain a certain form of leadership, we cannot deal separately with these demographic, strategic, and economic challenges. If we want to address the issue of economic leadership, we have to look at all of them together. And I found a quote by Raymond Aron dating back to 78 saying, we, Western European countries, all suffer to no longer have neither imperial ambitions, nor the ambition of European unity, nor the ambition to transform the world. In a way, whether we like it or not, we are all currently turning into Sweden or Switzerland. 78. So, the first challenge we have, I think, is a strategic challenge. The model and the core values of European democracies are under pressure, and these pressures are coming from different angles. We are going through difficult times. Firstly, we have some people out there, we clearly want to destroy our model and are the enemies of our, of our values, terrorists. This is real. We have attacks. Madrid, 2004, London, 2005, France for the last time at the beginning of uh, uh, 2015. ISIS reach among European youth should not be underestimated. It's rampant, and it's probably going to increase. Secondly, we have nations out there who do not believe or no longer believe in our model. These questions on the model come from outside, and to a certain extent, it's not only nations, it's also a certain fraction of our population. From outside, clearly, Russia, who is ready to fight against any expansion of our model, we see that in Ukraine. I start to have some questions on Turkey. We have slammed the door on Turkey. I think it was wrong. And the evolution we see these days is clearly a distanciation from the European model. The last one is China, not a negligible economic force, who clearly has the belief that democracy is not a precondition to reach economic prosperity. So we have big nations out there questioning our model. We have also inside the staggering disillusion of a growing fraction of the European population which thinks that the political system has transformed progressively the EU into the world's best breeding ground for populist parties. And they are depicting the European Union as a sort of monster created by incompetent elites. Well, I mean, describing uh, uh, the administration as a monster created by incompetent elites is, is something probably we share on both sides of the Atlantic, but it's probably stronger in Europe than what it is uh, in the US. Then we have, and this is a new element, very, very visible these days, we have a third challenge. We have those who would like to join our model, admire us, but do not seem to be welcomed, the refugees. And I think it's testing the core of our values because these people are risking their lives to live into models similar to ours. If we are not ready to welcome them, then we will be questioned on the seriousness of our values. So we are challenged from a strategic point of view. 
This is questioning the military retrenchment of Europe. Europe is the only part of the world where over the last 15 years, military budgets have been decreasing. It's clear that we have to decrease public spending, but decreasing it on the military side is probably not the best thing we uh, can do if we want to keep a certain form of leadership. We have de decreased our military budgets by 15% from 2006 to 2013. It will have, at a stage on, or another, to come to an end, and we will have to re-engage into NATO, but also probably into a more active, uh, um, I would say, military uh, uh, thinking of the world. The second challenge we have, besides this strategic challenge, is a demographic challenge and what we could call the uh, time bomb in Europe. Some European countries are facing a very, very severe demographic challenge, Germany. Between now and 2060, the German population will probably decline, if they do not change their immigration policies, to 65 million inhabitants. This would mean the country of the size of the Netherlands, Antoine, disappearing. It's not negligible at the European scale. In 2030, the group of persons aged 65 and more will represent nearly 30% of the total German population. More interestingly, if you look at Europe as a wall, Europe represented 20% of the world population in 1960, now constitutes 7%, and will shrink to around 5% in 2060. So less people, aging people, the birth rate in Europe is 9.9 .9 per thousand, whereas it's 12.5 in the US, it's close to 14 in Asia, and it's close to 38 in Sub-Saharan Africa. The birth rate in Europe is even lower than in China, where it's 12 per thousand. So a big demographic time bomb. And since demography is most of the time leading the prosperity of the economies, you see that it can be a very serious challenge. The last challenge is the economic one. And we are paying the cost of our complexity, of our heterogeneity, and of our divergences. The Eurozone was built to become the most prosperous region in the world, one of the most populated, but it has become over the last years one of the symbols of the economic crisis. We are losing ground as a bloc. The overall competitiveness of the Eurozone is called into question. We have a decreasing active population. We have high unemployment rates, in particular for the youth. Today, the European unemployment rate is 9.6% versus 5.1% in the US, so nearly double from what it is in the US. We have a productivity which is not satisfactory. In 2014, the productivity in Europe per hour was 20% lower than what it is in the US. Between 2007 and 2013, what the economists are calling the total factor of productivity has been modestly growing in the US and Japan, has been decreasing in Europe. We suffer from a lack of research and innovation. There are more than 30% fewer patents filed by EU citizens versus US ones. The EU overall expenditure on research and development amounts to 2% of GDP. It's 2.8 in the US. And if you look at the number of patents, I found uh, uh, numbers which are staggering. In 85, 1985, 30 years ago, not that far away, you had in the Eurozone 20,000 patents a year. In the US, 40,000. In China, 50,500. Oh. In 2013, 130,000 in the Eurozone, 245,000 in the US, 145,000 in China. What does it mean? We are lower than the US, lower than China. The technological revolution is there, but we have a risk which is to lag behind. Uncontrolled public spending is the next issue. And there, I'll be very brief, I will just mention what Mrs. Merkel has been saying, which is, I think, capturing the essence 
of the European issues as far as spending and entitlements are concerned. Europe today accounts for just over 7% of the world population, produces around 25% of global GDP, and has to finance 50% of global social spending. It's obvious that we will have to work very hard to maintain our prosperity and our way of life. So we have issues there. Last but not least, I mean the burden of excessive and of inappropriate regulations. Inflexible labor markets, legal uncertainties, sometimes naive competition rules, and I will come back to that. The precautionary principle, which is basically an aversion to risk taking, therefore an aversion, a long-term aversion to growth, because there is no growth without risk taking. This is not creating the business-friendly environment we would need to see the growth increasing. So the block as a wall could be seen as having lost ground. The second thing is the block is breaking up with increasingly important divergences between its member states. Despite what was originally planned with the Eurozone, which should have led to more convergence, we are seeing divergences. In terms of public spending, the difference between France and Germany back in 2003 was five points. 48% in Germany, 53% in France. Today, the gap is 13 points. So the gap has more than doubled within 10 years. In terms of youth unemployment, the gap was seven points between France and Germany in 2007. It's now 16 points. The gap between Germany and Spain was six points in 2007, it's now 45 points. 53% of the Spanish people under 25 are jobless today. In terms of R&D spending, if the average is at 2%, Germany is at 2.9, comparable to uh, the US. France is slightly above the average at 2.2. Spain, as an example, is at 1.3, and Italy would not be that far away. So growing divergences. The next point is you could have question marks about the ability of Europe to deal with the digital revolution, well, digital big data. And this would further weaken the European competitiveness. Very simple example. On the Forbes 2015 list of 100 richest people in technologies, which is a way to capture where are the entrepreneurs, you had 51 US citizens, 33 from Asia, 8 from Europe. So this is not great. So you see that we have strategic, we have demographic, we have economic challenges. They have been made worse by, I mean, the governance of our model because the EU enlargements of, two, of the 2000s were not very well managed and the rule of unanimity at 28 has proven to be a very significant burden in a world which is becoming more agile and more instantaneous. So our will to work together has diminished over the years because you have more and more European countries who want to opt out rather than to opt in. In the past, Europe used to be a thing where one subject was progressing and the others, I mean the, I mean the countries which were not part of the initial effort, were willing to opt in to join. Today it's the reverse. You start something and you have people willing to opt out. So sometimes, and this is going to be the end of the depressing part of my <laughs> presentation, you have the feeling that Europe could become what Ayn Rand was describing in Atlas Shrugged. I don't think we are there, in fact, because I think the European Union, despite all these shortcomings and despite all these challenges, has never been more relevant, but it needs to adapt its rules, it needs to adapt its priorities, it needs to adapt its governance, 
to the new times, to the changing times, which means reaffirming very strongly what our vision is, being ready to fight for it, redefining our priorities, and changing the governance. Why do we have significant competitive advantages? We, are one of the, we remain one of the major consumer markets in the world. We are a key reservoir of skilled labor. Europe is the place where most of the international students go. Of course, you have a lot of them in the US, but if you look at what are the destinations of the international students, the UK is hosting 11% of them, France 7%, Germany 5%. It's more than the US, in fact. <clears throat> the resilience of the Eurozone is a very positive thing. Of course, the Eurozone had a significant number of shortcomings, but the crisis has proven, as usual, that Europe was able to react and to react strongly when the, uh, uh, the, the, the very big threats were there. The ability to make major steps toward banking union, the, the new fiscal measures, a number of things done by the ECB as part of the QE policy show that we still have a reaction capability. So even if the stimulus of the ECB can be questioned, because some people see that as a way for governments not to do anything, in other terms, it's a sort of uh, uh, a hospital where the anesthetist is taking the key role and the surgeons are still at the bar outside. Uh, <laughs> it nevertheless works and gives us the possibility to move and go forward. Europe has many leading companies worldwide, a large number of them succeeding in Europe, but also outside of Europe. And France is a very clear example of that. Europe is still an attractive model. If Europe was not an attractive model, we would not have all these refugees trying to join. So what do we have to do? Reaffirm what we are standing for. I think there is a very important point. Democracies are a creation of the middle classes. If the middle class is not happy, the democracy is threatened. The middle class emerged because our economies were prosperous in the 20th centuries, or they were stabilized because of that. Why do we believe that there is a very strong link? Because the values we are fighting for, and they are the, exactly the same as the values here in the US, it's a very strong belief that individual liberty, moderated by the respect for the others, are the core of what we believe in. And it's the right model to succeed in the new world. Because in a world where technologies are going to enable us to change many things, but starting from a very, very granular uh, uh, dimension, individual liberty, the ability to create things, the ability to move, the ability to exchange are very, very fundamental elements of success. And the countries which do not believe in our model, which were over the last year sometimes slightly arrogant, are starting to run into trouble to hit certain difficulties precisely because of their poor governance. Some of them are democracies, but if you look at what people were saying about the BRICS and where the BRICS are today, it's a very clear illustration of the fact that the, uh, uh, let's say having a large workforce, having capital, accessing some technologies is not enough. You need to have a proper governance. And this could be one of the advantages of both Europe and the US if you can overcome some of the shortcomings we have seen. So now, if we move to the priorities, after having said that, I mean, we needed to redefine the vision, which has to be peace in freedom, democracy in prosperity. What do we see as being the priorities? I think we have three of them, and I'm sure some of you will challenge that, but the three core things for me, they are very simple. It's education, competitiveness, and security. Education is absolutely essential, and there, to be brief, what do we think we need to do at the European level? We need to invest more in primary education. We need to invest more and be more selective in our universities. We've been losing ground in the PISA rankings steadily 
because we have not understood that primary education was the absolute key. We need to educate people. We need education, not schooling. I mean, putting children in four walls is not enough. We have to ask ourselves, what do we teach them? And we need to adapt what we teach them to the new world. One of my favorite examples is to refer to Germany. Up to the 60s, most of the Germans were uh, learning to write in Gothic letters. Uh, it's not useful anymore. They moved in the 60s to foreign languages. We have to move to new technologies the way we have moved to foreign languages in the 60s. We need to integrate in the schooling system the new technologies. We need also to use the primary education to integrate better the children of the people who are coming from outside of Europe. Because if you start at primary school, it works. If you wait for too long, it doesn't work. There are a lot of uh, uh, studies on that. It's essential. The second thing, of course, is universities. We have a tendency not to be selective enough. We cannot afford to have hundreds of universities. We have to be more selective in what we do. This will have an impact not only on education, on research, on economic growth. The, uh, the second thing we, uh, we need to do is to improve the European competitiveness. And there, what we need to do is address public spending and tax reduction, labor market reforms, competition regulations, and the precautionary principle. We need to reduce public spending. We need to have reforms from our entitlements. I'll give you a very simple example. France is one of the few, if not the only country of the world, in the world, where the state is guaranteeing the deficit of the unemployment indemnification system. Crazy. Because it's making everybody unaccountable, both the employers and the employees. Cost of that, four billion a year. Is a reform possible? Yes. Is it done? Not yet. Should be done. It's by reducing public spending that we will reduce taxes. We cannot reduce taxes if we do not reduce public spending first. Secondly, we want, we need, we must, sorry, improve the agility and the flexibility of our labor markets. In today's world, the only way to be efficient is to have negotiations at the company's levels. To have this big circus of global negotiations leads nowhere in a world where employment is going to change fundamentally in the years to come. Technology is going to lead us into a new society where lifetime employment will not be the rule for the majority of the people and where skills will have to change very quickly. Some people say that people will have to be reskilled every five years. When the amount of knowledge is nearly doubling every 18 months, how would you, I mean, keep your skills for 40 years? It's nonsense. So you will have to be reskilled. We need to adapt the labor laws to take that into account. We need to change our competition regulation. Europe has been too naive about the concentration rules. We need to look at the companies and at their concentrations, taking a world view. Because if we don't do that, we will not be able to build European champions. This is not dirigisme. This is just pragmatism. By refusing to let the European companies concentrate more in Europe, we will leave the door open to Chinese, Americans sometimes, biggest competitors who will become world leaders, will have the technology, and will take the market shares. Last but not least, we need to change the precautionary principle. Because the precautionary principle is basically an aversion to risk. Look at what impact it would have on the energy sector if we were to do things with our shale gas, look at what it would do to nanotechnologies or to biotechs. Some very good French scientists are crossing the Atlantic to come here. Because of this precautionary principle, it's a waste for our countries. It's great for the US, and I'm happy for you, but it's, uh, I mean, it's, a waste, uh, um, it's a waste for our country. We must redefine what our risk appetite is. If we want to have growth, we have to accept risk. We need to redeploy our security policy. I've already uh, uh, spoken about that. Uh, we need to redefine our attitude toward security challenges. They are not only conventional ones now. You also have unconventional threats. 
the, uh, the militaries have now uh, uh, characterized that by asymmetric threats. Two bad guys in a garage can threaten you the same way two good guys can threaten large corporations by inventing nice things uh, uh, in the business field, but states can be threatened by small groups. You have to address that. You have to address the issue of cybersecurity. You have to redefine what the engagement of European nations is towards NATO, because the decline in budgets is leading to a point where uh, the effectiveness of the action is going to be, uh, to be questioned. Last but not least, we need to change our governance, I think. The, uh, we need to make a decision. Either the European Union continues to be enlarged, and it will be, at best, a free trade zone. This might be uh, a sort of British vision. It's not my vision. If we decide to deepen Europe, and I think we need to decide to deepen, we need to be more selective. We need to make choices. We cannot move at 28 at the same pace. So we need to select priorities. I have suggested some. We need to start with a hard core of countries. They do not need to be exactly the same on all the efforts. You can have different circles, but you need to start with a smaller core and move. And I think one of the areas, of course, where we should move further is the economic area. The, this way of moving Europe is a way to go back to one of the founding principles, which was subsidiarity. And it would be an answer to the UK concerns. And I think it would be the right way to move. And I think if we want to do it, we have to achieve it without changing the treaties. If we want to change the European treaties, it's going to be long, it's going to be hard, and there is a very high risk that it's going to be unsuccessful because the population doesn't want to vote on something which is seen as very unpopular. And I think we have the tools to do it because we can have what is called the enlarged cooperations mechanisms, which would enable us to deepen the cooperation on very uh, specific aspects. So overall, what I think is, if we very clearly redefine our vision, freedom, prosperity, democracy, if we are able to set priorities, education, security, competitiveness. If we change the governance, there are all reasons to think that Europe is going to stay an attractive model. This is in the best interest of the United States because we share the same values at the end of the day, because a destabilization or a decline of Europe would not be in the interest of the US, and it would have a profound impact on the world economy and because we cannot take for granted that security is a public good. So there will be no economic leadership if we do not reinvent the political leadership and if we are not able to address the strategic challenges. Is it going to be easy? Of course not. Should we do it? Of course, yes. And that's why I would like to end on a second quote from Raymond Aron dating back to 78, which is going to show you, I mean, how visionary he was. European unity is neither a complete success nor a failure. As always in history, it is the imperfect realization of a great idea. I will go for the imperfect realization of a great idea. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Henri. I have to say it's uh, rare that I've heard uh, remarks that were so infused with energy and yet so sobering at the same time. I think you've uh, presented us with a, uh, a lot of information and analysis that we will have to absorb uh, here in, in the United States to better understand what the hell is going to happen in Europe. <laughs> Don, you have a, uh, uh, perhaps uh, an easier task in terms of not perhaps uh, having to be so pessimistic. Donald Cohen is a f senior fellow here at Brookings, a native of Philadelphia. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Michigan. And he then set about occupying just about every single important post at the Federal Reserve on the staff, 
before being appointed to its board by President George W. Bush uh, and becoming vice chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve uh, to be succeeded uh, by someone named Janet Yellen. Um, and this shows you, of course, that Brookings, like every daily journalist, puts, first of all, the idea that timing is everything. To have Don here today when the things that have happened are perhaps that actually didn't happen, <coughs> just a few blocks from here, uh, voiced by uh, Michelle, and might be the subject of some questions and conversation. Don is also on the Financial Policy Committee of the Bank of England, where in, in June he predicted that the British, and as I read your speech, by implication, European financial markets would soon come to take on a much more important role in providing credit as bank financing became smaller. Uh, this leads us perhaps into a, a discussion about risk and financial stability. Don, take us where you will. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you, Fiona, Strobe, and Philippe for uh, allowing me to be part of this, this uh, panel and listening to Henri. So I certainly found Henri's talk very thoughtful and thought-provoking, and I want to reflect a little bit on some of my concerns about Europe. And then, Jim, you can take us wherever you want afterwards. All right. Um, I agree with your point near the end. We, freedom-loving people everywhere, Democrats with a small d everywhere, need Europe, European leadership with U.S. leadership. So uh, we do share your vision, the vision of Europe. We share the priorities of Europe, and there are too few of us in this world, and we need, we need a strong Europe. The U.S. would definitely benefit from a stronger Europe. Now, some of the things you said led me, as Jim said, to be a little bit pessimistic and to raise some questions. I do worry about Europe. I think that leadership from Europe will require you to coming, coming to grips with some of those issues but also with, uh, as I see, a, a very fundamental issue about what is Europe. You talked about Europe this and Europe that. It's 28 sovereign countries, or I guess 18 or 19 in the Eurozone, who have ceded some authority to the center. But there's a lot of tension between what they've ceded to the center and what they want to return, what they want to keep on their national level. And I think uh, Europe uh, has been subject to a couple of stress tests in the last five years. One of them came from the US, a global financial crisis, but it was amplified in Europe with the Eurozone crisis. And then the refugee crisis of the last couple of months. And it's revealed some real problems with where Europe is now. And I worry that both politically and economically, you're not in a stable place. It needs to move one way or the other. Now, one of the things you noted was the disillusion of a number of people in Europe about the center and about the elites and where they led them. So I think politically, you've gotten ahead of your citizens. Certainly, there's a lot of disillusion in the United States. Anyone who listened to the Republican debate last night certainly got an earful of that. Um, but we have a political process for working this out, and that's what you were looking at last night, a presidential election for the leadership of the country based on elections for the Senate and the House. And I think the citizens feel they can change Washington if they want to. And my sense is, in part reflecting some of what you said, that the citizens in Europe don't have that feeling. And there's not the um, sense of a democratic process by which you can turn, turn, the, turn the big uh, ship around. They are more, as you said, they're more alienated and frustrated in Europe perhaps than they are in the US. 
think a related issue that you highlighted that's going to require fundamental rethinking and fundamental challenges on the governance side is decision making. So this unanimous decision making for all major uh, major decisions, you've seen the the crisis management has been very clunky, very difficult, and very untransparent. So you have. In theory, unanimous decisions, eventually, but then somehow Germany, and sometimes Germany and France, have to be sort of taking the lead, and then everybody comes along with them. So how the decisions are made, whether there's a way of people disagreeing with Germany and France and making those views known and felt is not clear, right? So we have in the U.S., a Senate and a House of Representatives, and people can be in the minority and not get, their, not get their views reflected in law. And I think that's much harder in Europe because the process isn't there, and that's part of the frustration. So I do think you need the Europe. I, I worry about the political stability. I worry about the degree to which resentment is building up. And... Uh, that, you need to come to grips with that. And I don't know whether that's, I think that must be a treaty change to change the democratic processes and make sure citizens feel that they have a greater part in what's <clears throat> happening in the center. The second point, the sustainability point, I think is economic. So I think the Eurozone crises has revealed that it wasn't sustainable the way it was, right? So the adjust, adjustment within any currency union is going to be difficult because you can't adjust economic adjustment to a lack of competitiveness because you can't adjust the currency values. You have to adjust the cost of labor within the, and the prices within the union itself. And that's always going to be hard. It's hard even in the United States but it's made much more difficult in Europe because there's less central mo money flowing into the central fiscal authority that can then be taken from the prosperous places and sent to the less prosperous places to cushion that adjustment. And I suspect there's less labor mobility given the, the every country has a different language. There are lots of uh, different uh, programs to subsidize housing differently and different. So there's less labor mobility, there's less fiscal exchange support, and that makes the adjustment more difficult. The pain in Europe was aggravated by this decision-making process, the repeated crises that took so long and things got worse while they happened. The unwillingness to uh, transfer funds from the stronger countries to the weaker countries while they made the adjustment the, um, and, and therefore made the pain, the austerity, all that much more necessary and painful unwillingness to recognize the unsustainability of debt, the sovereign bank connection, so that when a country got in trouble, its banking system also got in trouble, the lack of flexibility in a number of peripheral labor markets and, and product markets, the unwillingness of the surplus countries, current account surplus countries, to increase their domestic demand to keep the European <clears throat> Union or the Eurozone growing while some people, while some countries had to adjust, and the very weak nominal growth in the whole area so that inflation ran well below target for a long time and the Eurozone, Euro ECB was very slow to stimulate the economy. That made all the adjustments and the pain that much worse. Now, I think Europe has dealt with some of these issues. So the banking union has helped to break the link between individual countries and the safety and of the banks in those countries and amalgamated that at the center. The, uh, but that's not complete. It's got more to go. The, I think the unwillingness to transfer from the, the stronger countries and the stronger parts of Europe to the transfer funds and to help to the weaker parts of Europe is still there and hasn't necessarily 
been overcome. Labor markets are being reformed, but slowly. Inflation is extremely low. The ECB has taken very uh, constructive steps uh, this year, but it was very late in doing that, and inflation is still low. And I th it's not clear to me that the surplus countries, the current account surplus countries, recognize their responsibility for the whole, that they need to adjust while they're asking the deficit <laughs> countries to adjust at the same time. Uh, so I, I'm not sure that Europe, I think one lesson of, the, of these crises is that Europe is kind of caught between sovereign countries and the center. I worry that it's not in a stable place. Uh, I think what's required for European leadership, which the world needs so strongly, is figuring out what's sustainable and how to get there. Um, you recognize this because you had that, uh, those thoughts at the end about deepening uh, the core, cooperation among the core, but I still wonder whether the populace of the core would be willing to do what you want them to do, so I'm not sure, I don't know how you're going to figure that out, to give ownership to the citizens of the country for this deeper, deeper Europe. So, uh, and I think there are lessons from the crisis about what works and what doesn't work. Some of what's been done may need to be rolled back. There's, it's time for a stock take to see where the sustainable points are, where your citizens will let you go, what's right and what isn't right. Too often in the past, I heard arguments for going forward in Europe of two sorts that made me extremely uncomfortable. One was the bicycle metaphor, right? <laughs> yeah. So we have to keep moving forward or the bike will fall over. And I thought that's not really a reason for taking an action that by itself might not pass a cost-benefit analysis. And if this union is so fragile that if you don't keep moving, it's going to fall over, it's going to fall over eventually anyhow, and I'm afraid it's, we've seen signs of that. The other rationale that always made me somewhat uncomfortable, and you saw this with the Eurozone, was we recognize that this action, forming a currency union, for example, isn't by itself sustainable, but it will bring other actions with it, closer economic union that does make it sustainable. And I think what's happened is there's been a lot of action and movement that maybe can't be sustained, and it's time to stop and take a look and see where you want to go. I'd be very interested in the lessons you're drawing from the Eurozone crisis about what needs to happen in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Let me take a couple of the thoughts that Don just uttered and try to frame a couple of questions out of them for you, Henri. Um, it's, it's been a, an article of faith, I think, for a long time that Europe advances through crisis, that crisis helps Europe come together uh, in ways that it wouldn't in uh, quieter times. But that doesn't seem to be the case this time, from your own description, uh, with the, the dysfunctional nature of decision-making and governance that you've outlined here. Um, the, Don said that you seem to be caught between sovereign countries and the center. Will France's economic problems that you've outlined be solved by the French or through Europe? <laughs> or at all? We have to start by solving them ourselves. And the, uh, I think it's going to come because there is going to be European pressure. We, we cannot have double standards. We cannot say anymore, and that, I, I think this is the uh, this is why. I mean, this the current. I mean, situation is an interesting one. You cannot, on one hand, say that you want more Europe, and on the other hand, not do your homework. I mean, the uh, uh, I had a very interesting discussion with a German journalist a few days ago. He said, "Well, French are well known for loving visions but hating homework." <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think we need to have both, and I think we can have both. If we want to have more Europe, we have to undertake the unavoidable economic reforms 
which will help us deal with our competitiveness issues. If we do it, I think most of the other European countries which have not done it yet will follow. And to a certain extent, I mean, Spain and Italy have moved very, very, I mean, Spain has moved very largely. Italy is probably gradually starting to move, but looking at France to see if it really happens. If we don't do our homework, we won't have more Europe. But as I listen to you talk about the problems um, that separate France and Germany today, the economic changes that have come, mostly to the detriment of France, to the advantage of Germany. I began to wonder if it makes any sense any longer to talk about the French-German motor. Is it possible that we've reached such an economic disparity between the two countries that they cannot work together? Or is it a problem of political leadership? Why isn't the French-German motor working? No, I mean, first, it's working better than what you would think. Second, it doesn't mean that there are no divergences. They are, and they have deepened over the last years. But I think it's reversible. And I think that to do it, because, I mean, you, you can, I, I could give you a speech on the, the German issues. I mean, they have their issues, too. I mean, demography is a very big issue. You know? the, uh, uh, I mean, their energy policy uh, is a very, uh, very big issue, because a very large part of their energy supply is relying on coal. Uh, I don't think it's something sustainable in today's world. So they have their issues, too. I think they are going to suffer more than others from a Chinese slowdown, if there is a Chinese slowdown, because they are very dependent. I mean, their automobile sector, their, I mean, their, their machine building sector are very dependent from China. So the issue is I mean, to align countries in the same direction. For that, we know that I mean, the two core things we have to address as French is labor market and public spending. And it's clear that there, I mean, any international institution has been pointing that for years. If we fix that, I think it's important, but it's not enough anymore to have a Franco-German axis to move things. Uh, why is it not enough anymore? Because you have the Central European countries who are taking a slightly different view, and because you cannot pretend that the two biggest economies in, the, uh, in Europe are going to dominate the rest. I think. I mean, it's like in our own companies. I mean, you do not manage the way you were managing in the last century. I mean, the world has become much more balanced. It's much more sort of, quote, partnership-like issue. But you need in the partnership some, quote, leading partners. If things do not work between France and Germany, most of these things will not move. If things work between France and Germany, there is a reasonable hope that, we'll, that they will be able to convince others. So it's a necessary condition. It's not a sufficient one. I will come back to uh, both energy and demographics in a second. But, Don, I wanted to ask you uh, to reflect for us briefly on the Fed's decision today not to uh, increase interest rates. What are the implications of that for Europe? What will the uh, synergy be here uh, on monetary policy between Europe and the United States? Well, I think the Fed is focused appropriately on maintaining good growth and getting inflation back up to its 2% target. I think Europe and the world benefit from a strong US economy. And uh, I, I think it would be a mistake to go back to where we were, say, before the crisis when the US consumer was driving global growth. That was unsustainable. The buildup of debt that made that possible led to the collapse that we saw in the global financial crisis. But the U.S. must be strong. Its growth must be uh, reasonably robust, and that will help uh, the global economy. So I think Europe benefits from a strong U.S. economy, and what you saw today was the Federal Reserve not willing to take risks with that so they said, yeah, labor market's very strong, unemployment rate's low, but we still have a little bit to go in terms of uh, the amount of slack in the economy, inflation going anywhere, financial market's a little disturbed. So we would be taking a risk to raise interest rates at this point, and they decided not to take that risk. Um, I think they made it pretty clear that their minds were still focused on when to, when to raise rates, 
it was a question of when, not whether. Right. But um, so I think Europe will will benefit to the extent that the Fed's decision helps the U.S. economy. Ari, you've been quite outspoken on energy. Uh, you've likened people who invest in fossil fuels today to people who invested in the asbestos industry in the 1950s and 60s. I said in coal. I was going to get to that. Not and, for sale, not all for sale. Right, coal. right. Um, and you've instructed your own company to divest uh, from coal producers to the tune of a half a billion dollars, which is a, quite an impressive decision to make. Um, but what I'm, what I'm wondering is how you go from there to um, the climate change. I mean, you, you're talking not only economics, but climate change to a great extent. What role will business play in the climate change conference in Paris? And how do you rate at this moment the prospects for success of that conference after President uh, Hollande last week suggested that it may not work? Well, I think he was slightly less pessimistic than what you imply. No, I think the very, st the, the, I mean, the interesting thing happening is that business is, is starting to involve itself. And why so? Because there is a growing degree of awareness. I mean, of course, we as insurers, we are in the first line. I mean, we are on the front. And what we see is really ugly. Hmm? The number of ca natural catastrophes is increasing. The severity of these catastrophes is increasing. A world with two <coughs> degrees more is probably still insurable. But a world with four degrees more would not be insurable at all. And this is not good news, not for the insurers, but not for the world in general, because this would mean that the, uh, let's say the whole world would be uh, in turmoil. I mean, we see that it's very, very, very clear, right? the, uh, the frequencies, the severity, the impact. So business, because business people are rational, when they think long term, they start to understand two things. First, that there are certain business propositions which are not going to work long term. And that's why I was, I mean, comparing coal to asbestos. If you know that something is bad, do you really want to consciously expose yourself, especially in this country, but also in others, to uh, uh, legal actions in a couple of years saying, well, you knowingly invested in coal, you knew that this would be bad, for the environment. You knew that this would be bad for people, so you have to pay for that. So more and more people understand that they are bad business proposition because these business propositions are threatening the balance of the climate. And there are more and more people understanding that with new technologies, there is a workable business in new energies, uh, if you, in renewable energies. If you look at the cost of solar energy as an example, the, the, I mean, the manufacturing cost of solar energy has decreased extremely substantially over the last 10 years. And this not because of public subsidies. Of course, it's still too largely subsidized. But you could see that as a long-term investment because the reality is the cost is declining and it's becoming a workable proposition. Business people are rational. They start to stop investing on one place and to invest more in the other one. So I think the fact that for the first time they will involve themselves in the discussions, the fact that some of them are starting to take commitments, I see that personally as good news. Because at the end of the day, they are the ones having, uh, um, I mean, the keys of the safe. Because it's private investment which is driving many of these good or bad phenomena. But is it your sense that business will play a major role in the conference? No, I, I mean, major, I wouldn't say that. I mean, we are starting to be engaged stakeholders, and it's good news. I agree. If I could ask you one more question before I turn to the audience for questions for both of you. Um, could you just give a sense of uh, the extent of the resolve of European and particularly French companies right now in continuing the sanctions against Russia if there's no progress on Ukraine? How eager, how uneager are French companies and European countries to see that resolved? Could I take the problem from a broader perspective? Please. Uh, I belong to those who think that uh, uh, we should engage Russia more and that there is not only Ukraine, there is also the Middle East. 
I think we've made some mistakes with Russia. Uh, I don't like Putin, I mean, <laughs> but, 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 but I think, I mean, what is the alternative? I mean, the alternative would probably be worse. So I think you have to deal with the devil you know. And uh, I think the, uh, I mean, you have to try to engage them because they are the key to the solution in a number of cases where I think we would be better off starting to, uh, I mean, have serious discussions rather than looking for confrontation. I am very clear about the point that, of course, in Central and Eastern Europe, there is an absolute red line. But for me, the absolute red line is the Baltics. It's not Ukraine. It was not Crimea. Uh, we'll turn to the audience for questions now. If uh, you could raise your hands, I'll try to call on you. And uh, if you could uh, identify yourself in any affiliation. Uh, we have a microphone coming forward to this gentleman here. Uh, Bill Drozdiak, I'm with Brookings and McClarty Associates. Uh, uh, for Mr. DeCastro, you mentioned uh, those frightening figures about youth unemployment, and there seems to be a growing disillusionment among young people in Europe uh, with uh, the European Union. Uh, what can be done to boost uh, employment uh, among young people so that we don't run the risk of a lost generation there and recapture um, some spirit uh, uh, of, of European unity, and a question for Donald Cohn uh, that may be related to the youth unemployment issue. The Fed has a dual mandate. Uh, it seems to be a fatal flaw, perhaps, for the European Central Bank that it only deals with price stability. Do you think uh, the ECB and its monetary policy would be more effective if they also had a mandate uh, to influence growth and employment? Uh, on, on, on your first, I mean, on, on the first part of your question, no easy solution. There are sort, I mean, short-term actions, long-term actions. Long-term actions, I think it's education. There are some very interesting experiments going on in France. Interestingly, not within the, uh, uh, quote, state system, but one of the uh, internet entrepreneurs in France, Xavier Niel, has founded something called School 42, where he's uh, taking uh, uh, young people between 19 and 23, approximately, which he selects, I mean, through, uh, um, I would say, not hackathons, but similar things, and he's teaching them to code. I mean, they, well, he is. They teach themselves how to code. Very interesting experiment. Very, very interesting, working pretty well, because many of these people are non-graduates. So, uh, uh, I mean, the, that's maybe one thing. But, but I mean, long-term education is key. We need to change the skills we teach, and we need to invest in primary education because the ones who have trouble finding jobs are the ones who had problems in the primary education. So everything is uh, played off in the first seven to eight years. So that's why I said you need to invest in primary education. It's not going to change things for the ones who are already out of it. For the ones who are already out of it, what sort of short-term actions can you take? I mean, in France, we have one issue, which is the, the minimum wage. There is a sort of political taboo on the minimum wage for young people. I think it's wrong. And the state, rather than subsidizing false jobs in the local administrations for young people, 80% of which do not find another job once this temporary job is over, they should better decrease the minimum wage paid by the private companies to the young people and match the difference. Because this would give them a real experience in real companies, give them real skills, and progressively integrate them into the labor market. I mean, the issue we have is that we have a very inflexible view of the labor market. Uh, here in the US, when people enter the, I mean, the labor market, many of them are in the lowest deciles. Three or four years later, they have started to climb the ladder. In France, basically, we have cut off the first two bars of the ladder. So that's why there is a barrier to entry. But there is not going to be any uh, quick fix 
because many of them have been without jobs for a significant number of years. And for these ones, it's going to be very difficult. So I agree it's a related question because I think one of the things you could do about youth unemployment is have stronger aggregate demand, overall demand in the economy. And in that regard, the countries that have fiscal space should be using it in order to stimulate demand in, the, in their countries, which will then spill out over their borders. And in that regard, I think the ECB was late and slow in, in adopting unconventional monetary policies, which unfortunately were, have been required in the U.S., in Europe, uh, be, after the financial crisis and certainly after the Eurozone crisis. Now, was it because they didn't have a dual mandate? I don't really think so. I think inflation has been low. I once said in an ECP conference uh, a year or two ago, if you were a person from Mars, if they have that, and you came down and looked at ECB monetary policy, you wouldn't guess that there's a symmetrical 2% or 2% or but a little below inflation target. Every time inflation tended to rise, they raised rates <laughs> in order to keep it from rising. When inflation fell and the forecast of inflation was low, they were very slow to That's react. Right. It looked very asymmetrical. I don't think there's a conflict there hasn't been a conflict over the past five years between inflation and employment. I think taking the 2% inflation target very seriously, doing everything you could to get to 2% would have um, er much earlier than they did. I think they're doing it now, but it was late, would have made the youth unemployment problem much less and would have put the European economy in the right place. And you don't need a dual mandate for that. Just need to take that 2% target seriously. I next saw a hand down here. Um, if we get a mic to the second row. Uh, good evening. My name is Sal Olium. I'm a EU visiting fellow here at Brookings. And I'd like to first congratulate the speaker on a masterful presentation. I think you really hit all of the spots on, in terms of the problems that Europe faces and the potential of Europe and the importance of Europe doing well. I would like to contest though, a couple of things which I found that you made. One is the connection between enlargement and deepening, uh, where you seem to be presented as a contradiction. Uh, full disclosure, I'm from Estonia, so <laughs> I will uh, definitely be in favor of the enlargement side of the equation. But let me just remind you that in 2004 and 2005, the European Constitution, which would have been a huge step forward as far as Europe's political integration, was not opposed by Estonian voters. It was ratified by all of the new member states, but it was refused by the citizens of France and Holland, two of the founding members of the European Union. Uh, you also said that it was a mistake to close the door on Turkey. I completely agree with you. And I think that brings up the issue of cultural barriers to both the enlargement and the deepening of Europe. And in France, I think, we have seen that the cultural barriers are quite often raised as one of the issues why the negotiations with the United States on the TTIP has not gone as fast as it could, why the single market, for example, on services has not gone as fast as we would want. Uh, how do you see the cultural barriers to integration being overcome, not only in France but in Europe as a whole, which I believe is the key both to Europe's survival and also to regain the leadership in the world? Thank you. I think it's going to be difficult, but I think we are at a turning point, at a testing moment, and the refugee crisis is very clearly indicating that. Because I think we are back to what do we really stand for in terms of values and culture. And I think the split is, do you really believe in individual liberties, tempered by the fact that you accept a sort of, I mean, collective discipline, respect for the others? I'm worried today because I think we have within Europe one state which is starting to play very strange games, I mean, to be totally open, it's Hungary. Uh, and I think taking a weak position towards Hungary on very fundamental values is a very, very bad signal. So I think the way to overcome the, quote, cultural barriers 
is to be absolutely clear on what you stand for and to be extremely firm with the ones who try to take the benefits mm -hmm. without really uh, uh, I would say standing for the real values. But, but it's a unique moment to clearly reaffirm what you believe in. Well said, well said. Um, the gentleman uh, in holding up the white uh, piece of paper. Yes, and my name is Per Kurovsky. Uh, I, since you're in the insurance business, you are now being permeated by the Solvency II, which starts imposing a little bit of the Basel's credit risk weighted capital requirements. Don't you think that Europe would have be able to aspire to more leadership, abandoning credit risk uh, adverse requirements, and for instance, going for job creation capital requirements, uh, sustainability capital requirements, something that has a purpose different than just avoiding risk? Okay, uh, interesting question, and, and I'm not sure I'm going to agree with you. Uh, I think there is no long-term growth without financial stability. I think one of the reasons for which you have seen no failure in the European in insurance industry during the crisis is precisely because all the big players were preparing themselves for solvency too. I mean, the ones who have failed were banks or bank insurers, but there has been no insurance failure in Europe towards the during the crisis because Solvency II was in the minds of everybody since, I mean, basically the end of the last century. Having said that, is Solvency II an ideal regime? No. What is wrong with Solvency II? It goes back to my point about risk appetite. The, uh, a very bad combination between risk appetite and investment horizons. In a financial system, and I guess Don would agree with me, if you want stability, uniformity is not the way to get it. You need to have different business models, different risk appetites, and different risk horizons. The insurers were long-term hands. By nature, they are not systemic. They have no liquidity issues. They do no transformation. They have a long-term duration of their liabilities. So they should be investing in long-term assets. Solvency II is preventing them from doing that to a large extent because if you take the combination of the accounting norms and the risk horizon of Solvency II, which is one year, so it's using the fair value system, which I mean I prefer to call immediate value because fair is a moral judgment, not a fact. So if you take the immediate value system and a one-year risk horizon, what you do is you shorten automatically the duration of your investments, and you create something which is very artificial. And I think this will have to be corrected. That's good news. Bad news, it's going to take a generation to correct it. And in between, we will miss gross opportunities. Uh, the lady back here with the glasses. Thank you. Good evening. I am, my name is Karen Muller. I'm a German lawyer currently seconded to the World Bank. And my question is that you've highlighted the current situation that there is a demographic degrowth, there is an economic degrowth, we don't really have inflation. And I would like to know both of your point of view on some German economists that are now emerging and saying, you know, maybe it's not a crisis, maybe it's not a phase, maybe degrowth is a glimpse into a future that Germany and the EU as a whole is seeing before the rest of the world. And maybe we need to stop waiting for growth, embrace, this, embrace the situation and figure out how to maintain prosperity and economic leadership in the world while having degrowth with, with a zero inflation. And I would like to know what you think about that. Thank you. So I think growth is very important. It's true that demographics everywhere in Europe, to a lesser extent in the US, even more in Japan, are putting a lid on and putting downward pressure on how the whole economy can grow. But on a per capita, per person basis, economies can still grow. And I think Henri pointed to some really uh, important issues for the US, for Europe, 
to promote that kind of growth. So education, uh, innovation, opportunity. And he also pointed to the risk of the middle class feeling left behind. And you can ask why this alienation, not only in Europe, but in the United States, of the many people towards what they feel towards their government. And I think part of it is they don't have the hope they once had that each generation is going to be better off than the previous one. So demographics can put some downward pressure on aggregate growth, but it doesn't have to doesn't have to un, undo this hope, this opportunity that's there. And, and I think and on both sides of the Atlantic, both sides of the pond, that's what we need to concentrate on. Productivity growth in the U.S. has been very disappointing. And it's not clear why. Partly it could be a lack of innovations, but partly it's we have some structural problems in this country. The White House and economists have pointed to too much licensing, too many barriers to entry in some, in some parts of our economy, service economy, service parts, for example. So I think there are things we can do to help growth, and that would be important for the political dimension as well as for the economic dimension. I'm afraid this will have to be the last question of the evening, and I'll give it to the gentleman here. Thank you. Uh, Matteo Garavoglia, I'm a visiting fellow here at the Center on the United States and Europe. It seems to me that 90% of the issues we've been looking at today have to do with governance deep down. Now, Europe is a multi-layered governance system, like the United States, but unlike the United States, it's a fragmented multi-layered governance system. We have effectively a situation whereby policymaking takes place increasingly at a supranational level, but politics, on the other hand, is still perceived by the average citizen and lived by the average citizen at the national level. So we have a gap between politics and policy. That is a problem for two reasons. One, uh, it is a problem in terms of the quality of the democratic process. This erodes the quality of our democracies. But it is a problem also in terms of policy output, in terms of legislative output, because if I am to win political kudos at a national level, well, I'll push for policies that will be positive for my own little nation state, but detrimental to the broader union as a whole. And I do think that the key reason why we have such a problem is that we don't have a pan-European public sphere. We don't have a public sphere that contributes to close the gap between policy and politics. How would you suggest we could start going about closing this gap between politics and policymaking by nurturing a pan-European public sphere. Thank you. More think tanks. <laughs> <laughs> Is that More your jobs answer? for us. <laughs> More think tanks, of course. I mean, Brookings, Montaigne. No, but I think it's a very, uh, uh, it's a very, very interesting uh, question. A couple of comments. Uh, I've seen Peter Skinner in the audience, who uh, has been a distinguished member of the European Parliament, and it's not because he's a friend that I'm going to say that, but I think reinforcing the role of the European Parliament is a way to reconciliate things. Uh, the second thing is, I, the, one of the reasons for which Europe isn't popular is a very simple and stupid one. When there was good news, it was dressed as being a national decision. When it was bad news, Brussels. So Brussels was the easy scapegoat of all the difficult decisions in Europe over the last 30 years. And it has probably created a very significant amount of frustration. So if you are a true European today as a local politician or as a national politician, I think you have to be more accountable in what you say and in what you do because it's too easy to blame Brussels for the bad things and to take credit for the good ones. Last but not least, I think one thing which is going to very quickly reconciliate us is Europe is the only pertinent perimeter in terms of security issues, and more and more in terms of uh, uh, economic issues. Uh, uh, Europe is what, I mean, our village was in the Middle Age, uh, and it's, I mean, the, it's what the nations were in the 19th century. 
I mean, we have our values. We will have to defend them. Uh, uh, I was listening very carefully to what Don was saying at the very beginning uh, and his fears about the stability of Europe. I mean, the perimeter has never been stable. 35 years ago, we had three dictatures, Portugal, Spain, and Greece, and they have joined. And it's good that they have joined. The Habsburg Empire lasted 700 years, and its perimeter has constantly changed up to the end. So I'm not worried by, uh, uh, by that. I think what's holding people together is a common view of their future. So the values and the ability to, I mean, expand explain to the middle class what's in it for them is absolutely critical. And if we can manage that, I think we will have this public sphere. Raymond Aron said that uh, in writing a column, there were two sentences that count. The first one, which gets the reader into the piece, and the last one, which sends the reader away with the message. And everything in between was just in between. <laughs> so to conclude, I'd like to take just a minute for each speaker, starting with Don, to give us the message to take away. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I think the last sentence that Henri, the last paragraph of Henri's response was the right one. People need to feel a stake, and your question was how to get them to feel the stake. And I think my, my question was, what democratic reforms and changes needed to happen so they felt the stake and so they could feel like they could change the policies when they didn't like the policies? So I, 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 I like what Henri said, and I think I'll let him have the last word. You get the last word. OK. Then I seem, I, I'm going to. Uh, and with, with a Portuguese say, which is, when the wind is blowing, some people build walls because they fear. Others build windmills because they believe in the future. I think we should build windmills. And on that note, we conclude thanking you for coming tonight. <laughs>